So before we move into the today's agenda, which is remote control, we'll first see what is Desktop Central. What is Desktop Central? Desktop Central is a unified endpoint management solution, which helps you in managing all kinds of devices, starting from desktops, laptops, mobiles, tablets, servers, and point of sale devices. Traditional endpoint management solutions has some drawbacks and difficulties in managing all these modern IT uh, environments where there are you know, multiple different kinds of devices and also the devices travel from one location to another all the time. So this desktop central offers an umbrella approach to manage all the endpoints in our organization centrally and more efficiently. So the UEM addition of Desktop Central includes all Desktop Central features such as batch management, asset management, software deployment, configurations, remote control, tools, and everything. Along with that, it includes OS deployment solution, modern management for Windows 10, and mobile device management solution. If you'd like to know more about UEM addition, you can visit this below URL. To know more. Desktop Central's remote control supports all three major operating systems Windows, Macintosh, and Linux. So here are the versions supported on each flavors. You can view this. Let's also have a quick look at the architecture of Desktop Central. So Desktop Central is currently an on-premises solution and which works as client-server application model. So agents should be installed on all the endpoints that you wish to manage and agents can be installed in multiple methods. In case if you're managing the machines through your Active Directory, you can directly install agents through group policy or you can download and install the agent manually or through script or from the console itself, you can also push the agents. After installing the agents, you can manage the machines which are in local area network, and also the machines in internet, which is WAN. Even roaming users can be easily managed from this desktop central server in a central location. So local area network machines, which are located in the same network where the server is located can be easily managed by the desktop central server directly. So this agent missions will directly reach out to the desktop central server. Whereas the remote office missions which falls under the WAN communication can be grouped as remote offices and you can easily manage them. So you can easily manage the bandwidth utilization with this option called distribution server. So what is this distribution server? For example, if you're managing more than 10 missions in a remote site, and if you have concerns with bandwidth, then you can use distribution server. So when a patch or a software task is created for the missions, which is located in this remote office, this distribution server alone will go to the main server and download the required files, patches, and distribute them locally to the client missions. All right, uh, so this is the architecture diagram of Desktop Central. So like I said, you can manage the missions in local area network and in wide area network, and also the missions which will be roaming from one uh, location to another location. So the missions in local area network will be communicating to the Desktop Central server directly, and the missions in wide area network can be made to communicate through the distribution server. So what is distribution server? So for example, if you're managing more than 10 missions in a remote site, and if you have concerns with bandwidth, then you can use this distribution server. So when a patch or a software task is created for this group of missions in this remote site, client missions will not directly reach out to the main server. Instead, the distribution server will reach out to the main server, download the required files, and distribute them locally. So this feature will help you in manage the bandwidth efficiently in your network. 
And similarly, roaming users who move from one location to another location can also be managed by Desktop Central. To achieve this, you need to enable NAT on your network, so network address translation, or you can place your Desktop Central server on demilitarized zone, which is DMZ. I presume everybody knows about DMZ. It's where you can host your server securely. If you do not wish to host the server in DMZ directly, then you can utilize the component called Secure Gateway, which is an optional component. So what is the Secure Gateway? Secure Gateway server acts like a proxy server between the WAN agents and the roaming agents and the desktop central server. Any communication from the WAN or roaming agents will be routed only through this secure gateway. So this ensures that your communication is secure all the time. All right, so that's it about the architecture. So here are the components that we have noticed. So we have already discussed about the server agent um, and the distribution server. So notification server is an another important component which plays an important role in any on-demand task like remote control or scans, etc. Even failover service is an another important feature which is available. So this brings in an additional server which actively monitors the primary server and takes over the operation when the primary server fails. So this feature helps you in eliminating the downtime in your business. All right, so Desktop Central's architecture is scalable to manage even larger networks up to 20,000 missions and even more. So this is possible because of the refresh policy that we have. So every Desktop Central agent will be communicating to the server for every 90 minutes. So that is called 90 minutes agent refresh policy. So this feature ensures that all the computers in the network contact the server regularly. Two important things are ensured here. The network is not being choked by agent server communication, meaning bandwidth is not disturbed due to agent server communication. Also, the performance of the server itself is not getting affected because of this 90 minutes policy. Desktop Central Server has its uh, intelligence to slice down the number of client missions that should communicate to the server per minute. For example, in a network of 90 computers, one computer per minute will reach out to the Desktop Central Server. Similarly, for the larger networks like 900 computers, 10 computers will reach the server per minute. And even for larger networks like 9,000 computers, 10 computer will reach the desktop central server per minute. So using this feature, agent can communicate to the server without any issues and hesitation. All right, so these are all the ports used by desktop central. So you may need to open the ports on desktop central server to make use of the required features. For example, voice and video chat is one of the feature associated with the product works in UDP port, which is 8443. An agent server communication happens in port 8020. And even you can make agent to contact server securely in a port 8383. So agent to server notification um, happens on port 8027 as well. So to know more about the ports, you can visit this below URL, desktopcentral.com ports. All right, so as we saw in architecture, you can install desktop central server in your physical machine or in VM machine. So you can also place the desktop central server in AWS or Azure instead of placing in VM or physical machine. So there are a lot of advantages placing your server in a cloud platform. So if you are a, a, a managed service provider, then placing the server in cloud will be an advantage for you, whereas you need to manage clients, the computers from different customers' network. And this is also a very cost-effective solution where you don't have to invest or maintain hardware and I mean hardware or infrastructure. 
and even roaming users management will be very much um, easier in when it's when you're hosting the server in cloud so desktop central will be available on cloud very soon so after that you will be able to directly subscribe for the desktop central cloud edition all right so we are also happy to introduce that we have recently introduced a new solution in manage engine which is remote access plus which is a standalone remote control management tool uh, which is available in two flavors on premise as well as cloud in case if you are willing to go for a standalone remote control tool you can go for it if you like to know more about this desktop central or remote access plus you can visit this url shown here or we have an expert panel available here you who can now or we can also answer your questions you can chat with them on this session all right so till now we have seen the architecture of desktop central how desktop central works so now we'll move on to today's topic which is remote control and tools so here's the agenda of today's training so first we'll start with the overview of remote control and we'll see how it works in the background followed by that we'll discuss on the uses of remote control and other tools with few real time examples first we'll see how an help desk technician can use remote control in this tool to assist the users and resolve the ticket second i have taken most common issues in pcs which is system slowness so let us see how we can use tools in desktop central to troubleshoot on this scenario and third in an organization enforcing it policies is very much important so we'll see the options available in desktop central to enforce them finally we'll also see how desktop central can be used to alert users in an emergency situations like your microsoft exchange server is down followed by that we'll be discussing on few other interesting scenarios and solutions that we came across in our support experience so like i said before in case if you have further queries you can always reach us in the chat our expert panel will assist you further by end of the session we will also be discussing on few commonly asked questions all right so let's move on so first why enterprise need remote control and tools so this remote control and tools will be very much useful for it help desk technicians and also for an it administrators so for example if an help desk technician needs to troubleshoot something to the end users he needs um, he need a robust tool to troubleshoot such as remote control tool and chat tool and all that and to enforce it policies it administrators need some robust tool to enforce the strict it policies and also to communicate to the users you can also use chat functionalities and all that so these are all the basic requirements of a remote control and other related tools in an enterprise environment so we'll move ahead and discuss about this in detail with some real time examples so first real time example that i have taken is resolving help desk ticket so for better understanding uh, let's assume that uh, end user bob sends a ticket through an it um, help desk portal self service portal and the ticket has been assigned to a technician called john so the ticketing tool used is service desk plus which is our manage engine solution so this service desk plus tool can be integrated with desktop central as well all right so bob has raised a ticket the ticket has been assigned to job um, the user uh, the technician john so now john the technician is going to use the remote control tool in desktop central to troubleshoot and resolve the ticket so there is two request raised on the ticket number one installing adobe acrobat application second troubleshooting on wi-fi connectivity issues so let me show you how help this technician john is going to assist 
on this scenario. So here is the self uh, service desk portal. So I'm logging in as Jonathan for better understanding. So I'm logging in now to the service desk plus console. So I'm going to check my tickets now. So I actually know the ticket number. So here is my ticket ID. I'll search for the ticket ID. So this is a ticket created by user Bob, and this has been assigned to the user uh, Jonathan, the technician Jonathan, which is myself. So now I need to troubleshoot on this request. All right. So now I'll go to the desktop central console and I will log in as John again using this. All right. So now I know the user who requested, um, you know, who submitted this ticket is Bob. So I'm going to go to tools, click on remote control, click on computer stab. So this computer stab is going to automatically list you all the missions with desktop central agents on it. If the missions are communicating to the server, it will be shown as green. If it is not communicating, if it is turned off or if there is any communication issues, then it will be shown as red. So for now, I know Bob is a user who raised ticket. So I'm going to search for the username Bob. All right. So I can use the search option here and I can search using username or computer name. I'm searching with the username here. All right. So now I have found out the computer that Bob is using. So now I need to connect to his computer through this remote control to assist on the request that he has raised. Before I connect to his computer, there are a few important options that I wanted to highlight. Number one, prompt user for confirmation. So this is a very important feature in terms of HIPAA compliance. So which enforces the users to uh, you know, always to seek permission from the end user before you connect to his computer. If I enable this option and if I click on connect, a small pop-up message will be visible on the end user's computer, which will ask for the permission that this user is actually uh, going to take control of your computer. Will you allow or not? So if user is going to click on allow, then I will be able to take control further and troubleshoot. So this can be enabled from here or you can enable from here. So you have other more options to enable these features as well. So you can exclude certain users from seeking this permissions as well. So these are all the settings available under user confirmation. Okay, so the next available option here is the viewer. So you have an option to choose viewer between HTML5 viewer and ActiveX viewer. ActiveX is a normal Windows component. So HTML5 viewer is an advanced viewer, which is supported in all advanced browsers. So HTML5 is most robust and uh, most user friendly as well. So I'm going to use this HTML5 viewer for now, and I'm going to connect to Bob's computer. All right, so I'm going to search for Bob's computer again. So this is a Bob's computer. Okay, so now I have this option here in this actions. If I click on this small dot icon, I'll be able to see the available users on that particular machine at the moment. In case if two or multiple users are working on the computer, I can ensure and connect to the right user. So now I need to connect to user Bob. So I'm going to click on Bob. Okay, so here is an another important feature. So first it is asking you to type the reason and also the SDP, which is Service Desk Plus Request ID. All right, so I already know the ticket number, which is 8381, uh, so I'm going to enter that. And the reason, so I already have that typed, just to make it quick. I'm just typing that reason, so I'm entering this. So the reason why we provide this option is to trace and understand why you're initiating this. So you can easily trace uh, during this audit, you can go to this history view and you can easily trace who is actually working on that on the reason behind everything. All right, so now I have connected to the Bob's computer. So Bob is currently using two screens, multi-monitor. So I can switch back between screens. And so here on the right-hand side, I have an option to choose client layout, vertical layout, and the horizontal layout. So I can choose any one based on my convenience. Okay, so now, 
I took control of Bob's computer. So now let's talk about the request. So Bob has raised two requests now. So one is he wants to install Adobe Acrobat application. To install Adobe Acrobat application, as a health technician, I need to get the installer files from the network share. But the network share is a confidential information, so I cannot share that information. I cannot uh, just like that access the network share, um, uh, you know, while the end user is looking on his computer. So what I'm going to do is, before I access the network share, I'm going to block, I'm going to blacken the monitor to the end user alone. So for that, I'm going to use this option called blacken monitor. So, but before I go and enable this option, I need to seek permission from the end user because this will be a panic situation if suddenly screen goes black. End user will not know what is happening on his computer. So to educate him about what is gonna happen, I'm gonna use the chat window available here and I'm gonna chat with him. So I can use the chat window and I can chat with him to seek permission from the end user. So once I get permission, I can enable the black and monitor option. So now the end user, Bob, will not be able to see what I'm actually working, but I can have full control. All right, so now I'm gonna access the network share. So normally what we'll do is we'll go to start menus, access the run window, and then we'll access the network share. But here we also have almost all useful shortcuts available. So this is a quick act, uh, quick launch icon. So if you click on it, you will see all these options here. If I wanted to launch command prompt, computer management window, control panel, device manager, event viewer, explorer, everything can be easily launched from here. So now I'm gonna directly launch Windows Explorer window. So that has been launched. So now I'm gonna access the network share. Okay, so here's my network share. So this is the file that I have. I'm gonna copy this file over to my desktop and I'm gonna start installation. All right, so now I have successfully installed the application. Now it's time for activation. So I need a license key to activate it. So now I know that this license file which is needed for this activation is available on my local PC. So I'm gonna use the file transfer option here to transfer that to this computer. So when I use this option, it'll ask me to choose the source location, which is my desktop. And also I will choose the destination location, which is the end user's desktop. So I'll choose the file, click on transfer. The file will be transferred over to the desktop. So this is a file that I'm gonna transfer. So I'm gonna apply this license file. So now I have successfully installed the application. There is no confidential information. I'm gonna just delete these files and I can revoke the monitor to the end user. All right, so this is the first request. So first request for installation. So I have successfully installed the application. All right, so now let us also have a look at the other options available here in the control screen. So here using this options in the left-hand side, you can adjust the screen size. You can fit it to actual size or full screen mode, or you can refresh the screen. And here are, uh, here are other options like you can use the shortcut to unlock the computer, control, alt, delete, alt, tab. You can disable the inputs in case if you don't want the end user to disturb your activities on his computer, you can disable the input. Um, you can use the client's keyboard to troubleshoot. You can enable view only mode, which is just like a stealth mode and all that. And you can also enable, uh, you know, take a screenshot from here directly using this option. Likewise, we have already seen this quick launch option. Apart from this quick launch options, you have power options where you can invoke log off command, reboot command, reboot and safe mode, shutdown options. Even administrative tasks can be easily launched from this option. You can also change the user privilege that I wanted to use. By default, this will be run as a system user. All right. And chat options, you can invoke text chat, voice call and video call, and you can also use hotkeys, which is used for uh, using shortcuts. 
so control alt escape so you can just press and hold based on what shortcuts you want to use and you can use it and importantly and the right hand side you will be the end users can see who is actually controlling so john the technician name who is controlling whether the session is being recorded or not so all those notifications will be visible on the end users screen as well all right now let's come to the second request the so second request that this uh, bob has raised is the wi-fi connectivity issue so now i need to troubleshoot on the wi-fi connectivity issues on this bob's computer so i am a first level technician so i with my limited knowledge i'm trying to do some troubleshootings from the device manager and all that uh, but i cannot uh, troubleshoot and fix the issue properly so now i'm going to request help from my senior technician so who can assist me on this so i'm going to call him so he agreed to connect on this existing session to connect so now let me show you how the collaborative remote control mode is going to work so now the john uh, the technician is already on a remote session so another technician named peter will also going to connect to the same session and troubleshoot so i'm using another browser and logging in as Peter. All right, so I have logged in as Peter now. So here you can check the user account details. All right, so now I'm going to go for it. Tools, remote control section, computers. I'm going to search for Bob's computer. Obviously, I can easily found out, uh, I can easily find out the computer name because it will be visible as view desktop. So since the session is already active, I will only see this uh, status as this uh, view desktop. So the Peter can click on view desktop. So it is just giving you an alert that John is already sharing you, uh, sharing in this desktop. Click on yes to connect. So Peter also has control, um, can see his control, uh, see his screen. But Peter cannot uh, very well use the, um, you know, screen or work on his screen because by default, it will be in view only mode. As you see here on top, it says that currently you are in view only mode. So which is actually for enforcing one active user to work on that screen. So second user will always be on active mode. In case of the second technician needs active control, he's gonna go to this settings option, click on active mode to request control. So now Peter will have full control so he's going to troubleshoot on the remote control issue. So now on the right hand side, you can see two technicians, John and Peter, controlling his computer. End user will also know about this. So now Peter is going to access the device manager on Bob's computer. He's going to reinstall the network adapter settings. So he has successfully reinstalled the network adapter settings. And so he fixed this issue. So now Peter has disconnected from his session, but he has informed me that a computer has to be rebooted in order to um, get these changes applied properly. So now I'm John, the technician available with the customer, uh, with the Bob already. So I'm gonna let the end user know that this computer has to be rebooted. Then I can, I, uh, again, I'm gonna use the chat functionality. I'm gonna seek permission from the user Bob to reboot his computer so after getting permission i'm going to use the quick launch option again to reboot the computer so i can reboot the computer in a normal mode as well as in a safe mode based on my requirement i can do it so even if i click on reboot this remote session will be active and it will connect back me again into the session so it's reboot and reconnect so that is how the help desk technician john assisted end user Bob on resolving the help desk ticket. All right, so now the issues were resolved, reboot is complete. So now John is disconnecting from the session. Once John disconnects the session, he will get this small pop-up window, which is asking for adding the work log. Okay, so we already have entered the ticket ID when we enter the reason and all that. So now you have an option to directly change the status of the ticket. You can also close the ticket directly from this window as a part of integration. So this is an integration feature. So 
after you integrate service desk plus and desktop central you can utilize these kind of features over here so now i'm going to add the work log directly over here i'm going to save this right so this work log will be automatically added to the ticket so if i go to the ticket and view the ticket now all right so now if i go to the resolution status the resolution will be updated and if i go to the history the resolution and everything will be shown over here who uh, worked on the ticket and when the remote session was initiated so every single details will be traced as a work log over here so that's the first scenario on resolving help desk ticket so if you have any questions regarding this particular scenario you can let us know we'll discuss on the chat all right so now we have discussed about the practical uh, workflow of remote control tool so now we will also see how it works in the background so here's the architecture diagram how remote control is going to work so okay so now first this is the desktop central server so first the technician one logs into his desktop central server console so search for Bob's computer, clicks on connect, the request will be sent to the desktop central server. So desktop central server has two components, gateway component and notification server component. So notification server component receives the request sent and this request will be forwarded to the client machine. So client machine will be having a remote control services running. So notification server will invoke the remote control services Remote control services will automatically capture the images of that machine and send them to the desktop central server. So this gateway component transmits those images to this technician screen. Similarly, if technician 2 is going to connect to his screen, he's going to click on view desktop. So since the session is already active, gateway already shares, you know, just going to share the existing image files to the technician 2 as well. So that's how two technicians is going to share the same screen. All right. So trust this is clear. So let's move on to the next real time example. All right. So in this scenario, we'll see how an IT administrator can troubleshoot on system slowness. So system slowness is a very common scenario in an IT environment. So let's assume uh, one of my senior manager, his name is Mark, submits a ticket regarding this system slowness issue. So now, as a technician, again, a technician John is going to assist on this scenario to uh, fix this issue. So how I'm going to do that? So what are the options available in desktop shampoo? So I'm going to log into the console again. So here, with the tools. So usually for the system slowness issue, we will normally uh, intend to check the services running or the unwanted processes running and all that. So you don't have to take a remote control all the time to check on that. So you can use this option called system manager. So this is very helpful. So if you take remote control, obviously you're going to consume some time of the end user as well. If you're going to use a system manager, you don't have to disturb the end user. In the background, you can directly take control and view all the processes running, services running and all that. So let me connect to us. So you can go to the machine, click on manage and click on any of this options available. As soon as you click on it, a new tab will open. So this is gonna just do a quick scan on the processes running and it will list me all the processes running on the mission. Here you go. So these are all the processes running. So from here, I can easily uh, sort this based on the username, session ID, memory usage, and I can even close some processes to see some changes on the computer's behavior. Okay, so now I have killed some few processes, but that doesn't make some, uh, you know, much changes here. I'm going to go for services now. Now I'm going to look for any reasonable services which might cause the slowness, and again, Unfortunately, I couldn't find any. If I could find any, I can do some changes to this properties of the services like restarting, 
uh, disabling it or starting it, stopping the services, all this can be done here. Right. Apart from that, if I wanted to do uh, run some commands remotely, I can run some commands with system user privilege by default, or I can use this option to change the privilege to run some commands with the current user privilege as well. And similarly, registry changes can be done remotely from here. You can do every changes, you can explore it, you can do any changes, you can delete it, add new key, you can modify it, you can edit this. Everything can be done from here. And even file level management can be done remotely. So instead of taking remote control, if you wanted to take, uh, if you wanted to do some quick file transfer, you can go to this option, add files, select the file from your computer and you can transfer the file. Similarly, if you want to download a file, you can download a file from the end user's computer. You can move a file, delete a file, rename a file, everything can be done over here. Not only file, even folder, activities can be performed. This is file manager, even viewer. So this is one thing. So um, as a technician, I also wanted to check some event logs to see if there is some um, error message or warnings shown on the event logs as well. So I can use the filters. I can set some filters, which is warning messages, errors, and I can apply these filters, check based on it. So I can easily view the messages from here directly. So this is also an advantage for me. And even if there is any issues with the drivers, if I wanted to do disable some drivers, if I wanted to check the status of the drivers and all that, I can easily do check this from here. I can do some activities like disabling the drivers. I can get the device ID, PNP device ID, everything from here. And shares, what are the shares created on my computer sessions, active sessions, open files can be easily accessed from here. And printers mapped onto that computer can also be easily viewed. You can export this as a report. Group management, in case if you wanted to add some user to the administrative group or remove the user from administrative group or any other group on that computer, you can do that from here. And software uninstallation. Again, another scenario for slowness would be uh, due to some unwanted softwares which might be running on that computer. If I want to quickly uninstall them, you go to this list, see the application, search for that application, uninstall it from here by using this icon. So this is also an important option. Similarly, user. You can view all the user details, the SID of every user, status of that user, full name of that user, everything. So you can also export some report out of it. You can add, uh, add some columns or remove the columns you need. Right, so now uh, I couldn't find any significant difference after doing some basic uh, troubleshootings from the system manager. So the next available option for me is to clean up some unwanted files from that PC, like cleaning up some unwanted files in the temporary folder, uh, cleaning up unwanted drives, uh, defragmenting the drives and all that. So I can go to the tools section, click on this option called system tools, so in this tool section, you have this option called add task. So in this option, you have an option to add three different types of tasks. Okay, let me show you the one which I have created for it. So now I'm gonna create a task for the Bob's machine, which includes check disk activities, disk cleanup activity, disk defragmenter activity. I can check all or I can select only one or based on my requirement. Click on next. So next, the settings for check disk. So here it will ask you to select the disk drive to do the check disk. I can enable and disable those options that I need. Click on next, go for the next option, disk cleanup. So here I can enable the storage sinks, which is available on the latest versions of Windows. You can enable these options for this. And then I can go for the other disk cleanup activities. I can enable temp file cleanup, error catch file cleanup, catch browser file cleanup, log file cleanup, and all those. Even backup and restore files can be cleared from here. Click on next, go to the next option, disk defragmenter. I can even choose multiple disk drives from here. I can select in what operation mode or priority or the defragmentation mode that I wanted to use. You can click on this help card to know what this act, uh, the definitions for each of these uh, menus or options here. And you can click on next. 
So here's an important option, which is defining targets. Okay, so now I know uh, where this user, Bob, is located. So I know he is from a local office. So I'm gonna select that local office and I'm gonna filter it based on the computer location and I can target that. In case if I wanted to target that to all the machines in that local office or multiple remote offices, I can view it, uh, I can do that from here. And next will be the scheduler option. So generally, you can add some specific administrative privilege to be used for running these activities. You can set some conditions over here and trigger option. So this is where you will be configuring the frequency of it, how often you want to run this task. Only once or every time during system startup or at log on when idle, daily, weekly, you can set that time here. Start time can also be set. So you can also use some advanced settings. You can synchronize account, uh, across time zones. Expiry date for this task can be set, everything. And importantly, the storage syncs. So if you are using the latest version of Windows, you can enable the separate schedule for storage syncs. And this will automatically you know, clean up this. All right, so next is our conditions. So you can also set some idle condition. Only if the machine is idle for these many hours, you can run this task. And power management based conditions can also be set over here. So now I click on finish and I will enable this task. So this task is gonna run on Bob's computer, uh, right? And then the end user is gonna report me the status. So now I'm gonna request this user to observe the status of the machine for two days and update me the status through email on the ticket itself. So how do I inform that to the user? So I'm going to chat option. I'm going to search for the user name Mark. Select the computer. So chat is based on the user name, not based on computer. So it'll ask me to select the computer that is uh, Mark is using. So I can use the text chat or I can use voice call or video call. I can initiate it from here and I can talk to him directly and I can inform him. So this is how an IT help desk technician or an IT administrator can troubleshoot on the system slowness issue. So here are the topics that we have seen on this module. So we have seen how task manager can be remotely accessed, how to stop the services, how to access event logs remotely, run commands remotely, how to run some check disk and all that, all right? So if you have any queries pertaining to this particular scenario, you can also um, request us on this chat. We will help you further. All right, so here's the third scenario, which is enforcing IT policies on network computers. Okay, so to reduce the wastage of a power in an organization, uh, my IT department has planned to shut down the computers after business hours and wake up the machines before the production hours. So what are the options available to achieve this activities in this desktop central tool? All right, let me go to the desktop central console. In this tool section, you have this option called a remote shutdown. So my intention was to shut down the missions regularly after the production hours. So I can use this option to instantly shut down the mission or restart the mission, hibernate the mission, standby lock. Or my intention is to schedule this task. So I'm gonna create a task and I'm gonna schedule this accordingly. So here I'm gonna select the option as shutdown. So options, shutdown mode. So force shutdown or you're gonna allow the end users to sh uh, skip the shutdown activity if he is alive with that computer. You can set the timeout setting for a message that you can show on the missions um, before the shutdown. And you can select the target computers from here and you can set the schedule based on it daily task, weekly task, or monthly task. So now my intention is to do this daily. So I'm gonna set this as every day and daily and set the time. So this task is gonna automatically shut down the mission. Right, so now I'm gonna wake up the missions at the same time before the production hours the next day. 
So for that, I can use this option called Wacon LAN. So here I can instantly enable or invoke the Wacon LAN command using this option, or I can schedule this Wacon LAN scheduled task like we saw before. You can give a task name, you can use the port used for it. So this is a waiting time for the wake up for the missions. You can select the target missions or, or the target domain or the target remote office, and you can schedule this like we did before. Okay, so there are a few things that you need to understand when it comes to wake on LAN. So here are the prerequisites for the wake on LAN to wake up the computers remotely. First, IP broadcast should be enabled on your router, that is in your network. And one computer with desktop central agent should be alive for each subnet so that that computer, which is alive, can broadcast the magic packets to the rest of the missions to wake up the missions online. So using this, you can wake up the missions automatically on a regular basis. So that is how you can enforce this IT policies. Okay, so now if I wanted to uh, generate some report based on this activity, I can go to the report section. In this report section, I go to power management reports, system uptime report. So using this report, I can use the filters, set the time frame, and export any kinds of report to just fetch how many times the machine is up, how many time, uh, how, how much time the machine is down. So you can go to the detail view to export detail information as well. All right. So first, you need to enable this option uh, and set the details, you know, threshold value to maintain in the database. So that is a section available here. Apart from this, if you wanted to enforce other IT policies, you can also enforce IT policies using this option called configurations. So here you you have another power management option through which you can set the default power management scheme, right? You can create your own scheme, set the conditions when it shut, uh, when it should shut down, when it should turn off, sleep, hibernate. You can set these conditions, you can set the targets, and you can deploy that. So these are all the options available for power management and also to enforce IT policies in your computers and network. All right. So that is the third scenario, and let's move to the last scenario, which is if a Microsoft Exchange server is down, how to notify the users? Okay, this is again a very critical scenario for an IT administrator. In case of a Microsoft Exchange server is down, end users will not be able to send any emails, so they will automatically try to contact the help desk technicians and they will be bombarded with um, phone calls. In order to avoid such spike in a network, you know, in a phone call to the help desk technicians, as an IT help desk, uh, IT administrator, I can do some um, actions to prevent or alert the end users that we are already working on it, and this will be a downtime, and we're gonna we're gonna fix it soon. So how do I do that? How do I notify that to the user? So we have an option called announcement in this option, I mean, in this tool section. So using this announcement option, you can create a task, you can publish any kind of messages to the end users. So for example, my intention is to notify the end users about the current uh, Microsoft Exchange down, server down. So I'm gonna type my message, add a title to it. I set the time, announcement time. So start time and end time, I can, set that to be shown only once or multiple times for every 10 minutes as an alert. I can set that as a target user. So I can select them based on a remote office or a domain or a user-based custom group. Custom group is another important option in Desktop Central. So this announcement is an user-based activity. So you can only target it to the user or a group of user or a group of users in a remote office. So you can also use a user-based custom group. So for that, you can go ahead and create from admin custom group. Here you have an option to select what type of custom group that you're gonna create. So you have different types. So for now, I'm gonna choose a static where I'm gonna add my computers manually into it. So 
So I'm going to select the domain and I will select the computer's uh, users and I will add them one by one. So if I have a predefined user custom group, I will select them from the list, I will use it. So that is how I can publish an important alert messages to the end users. After I publish the messages, end users will be able to see this type of window on their end. So this shows the message and all that. All right, so that is all about the real-time scenarios. So next thing that we're going to discuss about is how secure is our remote control. As you all know, this remote control and all tools that we have seen so far uh, does include some sensitive data about the end user that you're going to work with. So how secure is those data that are being handled in this tool? Right, first, we are compliant with HIPAA and PCI and trade practice compliance with certain uh, features available here. First, user a role-based user control, I mean, user access control. For example, um, you might have noticed that I have logged in as a user John, and I also have created another user called Peter. Similarly, I can create any number of user. It can be an AD user account or a local authentication-based account. And for each account, I can specify the necessary um, roles. I can even customize the roles based on what role that particular uh, technician is going to possess. In case if he is an help desk technician, he only need access to the tool section or only the remote control section. So he can, uh, or and as an administrator, I can enable or disable those kind of activities. Apart from that, in the remote control itself, you have some other uh, security features. So here in this, um, you have an option to disable um, the wallpaper and disable the blackened monitor on the client machines when you connect to it. Uh, user confirmation, we have already uh, noticed this. And uh, even screen recording, you can enable screen recording as a proof and keep it for the record keeping. Uh, when, when, when you enable this, you have an option to enable secure uh, record, um, you know, downloading purpose. So only the authorized user will be able to download the downloaded, uh, I mean, the recorded files from this activities. So those kind of activities are available, uh, those kind of security settings are available in the remote control. Similarly, for the system manager, we have seen that there is some sensitive data uh, which is involved in command prompt. So Using this command prompt, uh, the technician who's going to access this end user's computer can do anything, right? So to limit this accessibility, we have an option called System Manager Settings, which is under Admin, under Admin System Manager Settings. So here we will allow you as in the main administrator to enable or disable that to the specific technicians. So it can be permanently disabled for all user if it is against your company's policy, or it can be disabled only to users, not the administrators, all right? So these are all the options available to ensure that you are using a secure um, tool in Desktop Central. All right, so that's it about the remote control and tools. So, so far we have seen the uses of remote control and other tools with some real-time example. So now we will also discuss some other interesting scenarios that we came across in our support experience. Okay, scenario number one. How do I measure the time spent by technician who are handling the tickets related to desktops? Okay, that's very simple. Like I said before, you can log into your Service Desk Plus console, and if you go for a ticket, you can search for any ticket. For example, I'm going for this ticket, click on this ticket. So in this tickets, if you go to the task view, you can easily see the technicians who spent time on this ticket, how much time they have spent, start time, end time, and everything. So that is going to be a very useful option for you. All right. Scenario number two, we would like to monitor the activities of the students in our school without their knowledge. Is this possible? 
yes of course so this can be considered as a stealth mode of course you can definitely do that in the remote control in the remote control settings you have an option to enable the stealth mode for example you first need to um, disable this options like uh, seeking permission from the end user that has to be disabled if you want to enable uh, if you wanted to monitor that in a stealth mode and black and monitor option should also be disabled disabling wallpaper or disable arrow theme has to be disabled and notify the end users about remote connection also has to be disabled and view only mode has to be enabled and also you can disable keyboard mouse of the climbing that that has to be disabled as well so if you enable this view only mode after disabling all those functionalities you can just view who is actually working and what the user is actually doing on the computer without even disturbing them and without even uh, knowing with them so that is the main option available here all right scenario number three so we are a healthcare company that needs to be compliant with certain regulations such as HIPAA. Of course, we already have discussed about this option, which is user confirmation. You can globally enable this option, which is for HIPAA compliance actually. So HIPAA compliance is just enforcing a method of seeking permission from the end user before you connect to his computer. You can enable this option, you can customize your message. You can enable this as a permanent, option you can exclude specific users from uh, you know seeking permission for them so these kind of options are customizable scenario number four installing and configuring iis on a remote machine is complex i want to document the process and use it as a training material for our newcomers is this possible of course yes this is completely feasible so yeah, you can enable this screen recording session before you initiate a remote control. And in the first session, you're going to do everything clearly on the remote session. And after that, after you end the session, you can directly download the recorded video from this link. So this can be used as a training material, can be shared to your colleagues. All right, so scenario number five. I find my remote sessions are slow when I'm in a different country and roaming users. How do I fix this? So like I informed before, you can manage the missions which are roaming as well. So missions who travel from one country to another who might not be in VPN all the time and all that. So uh, bandwidth might be the one important concern that you need to think about. So for that, you go to this option called Tools Remote Control Performance so in this, you have an option to customize the compression and the color quality setting. So in case if you find slowness on that, you can set the compression level as um, best or fast and set the color quality as medium or low. So this will enhance the performance of the remote control based on the bandwidth is being available there. All right, scenario number six. One of the users suspects an unauthorized remote access to his mission and has raised it to an IT manager. Is there a way to order the remote connection to his mission? Of course, yes. So like I said before, there is two options. The one is this. You can easily trace down who has initiated the session, the technician name, the computer name, end time, start time, duration spent and everything. You can download even a video. Uh, apart from that, in this section, in this admin section, you have an option called Action Log Viewer. So in this, all the activities which is done by the technician, since the login will be easily traced, not only on remote control or the tools section, but on all the activities, software deployment, inventory, OS deployment, MDM, all these activities will be traced over here. You can also use this as an audit report. All right. So that's it about uh, the scenarios. So we'll discuss about a few uh, commonly asked questions, finally. All right, I'm running desktop central app in my mobile. Can I initiate remote control via app? Yes, of course. That is another important option that we provide. So we provide mobile app for desktop central server. So you can download this on your smartphone and configure this. And after that, 
you will be able to access and take control of any computer from the mobile app directly. For example, this is a mobile app view. I will search for a computer name, click on connect using this icon, entering the reason. And next, this will be the gestures that I can use on my mobile device. So this is just a help card. So based on this gestures, I can use this gesture. So this is how I can control the computer. So even if the machine is available in a different country, if you are available in a different country, you can easily use this mobile app and take control of a mission. All right. Next question. Does the scene, uh, screen recording needs to be turned on before you establish the remote control session or can it be turned on during the session? Yeah, screen recording session has to be enabled before you initiate a remote session. So that is the answer here. And question number three, to allow multiple texts to work on the same remote that does it require additional license from Manage Engine? There is no additional license required for two technicians to work on a remote session at the same time, but to create multiple user accounts on your desktop central console, you need technician licenses. All right. Question number four. Will the remote control automatically reconnect after the reboot? Yes, of course. If you enable a reboot, option from the remote control, it will automatically reconnect to the session. And question number five, my remote control screen shows port 8443 is blocked. How do I resolve it? Okay, this is in one other important and most common scenario that you might face. So like we discussed in the ports, we have separate ports for each and every activities. Uh, similarly, for the tools section in this tools, here in the port settings on the right hand side, you will be able to identify what are the ports configured for it. So these are all the ports that I'm using currently to it. I can enable HTTPS mode or HTTP mode. In case if this ports are being occupied and if I'm getting some error message that this port is already occupied during the remote control, I can very well change the port, save this. After that, I'll be able to take control of the machine. So that new port will be used for that remote control. So that's how I can resolve this. Right, so is it possible to take control, uh, remote control of roaming users? Of course, yes. So like I said before, as long as you see the machine status as green, even though the machine is in local network or in van or in internet directly, you can take control of the machine. All right, if you have disabled keyboard mouse, does it automatically disable it for the new text sharing the session? Um, Right, of course, yes. So the new technician who joins in to, his, uh, to the existing session will only have view only mode as we saw before. So the new technician has to request for active mode from the tool section to take control over the session. So only one active user will be available on that remote session. All right. Okay, so that's it about today's webinar session on remote control and tools. Hope you all enjoy the session and trust this was very informative for you all. If you guys rate, uh, if you guys like this webinar, you can rate us on the scale of one to five, whereas five is the best. And you can also share words regarding this training session on your social media um, portals here using these hashtags. And so here is the next training schedule, which is on configuration and hidden tricks. So this will be on the next week, Wednesday. Stay tuned for this training. All right, so we also offer personalized uh, web demo for the users who are interested in um, having a personalized demo for this products. If you're interested, please do raise a request using this URL below, or you can let us know through chat. We'll be happy to assist you on that. We also have uh, EMS tours around the world. So here are the schedules for the EMS tours. So we conduct workshops and seminars in Indonesia, Johannesburg, Riyadh, and Jeddah. In case if you're nearby, you can utilize this opportunity to get more insights about Manage Engine and its tools. All right then, so 
Thank you everyone for joining today's webinar and spending your time with us. Hope this was informative again and have a very nice day. Thank you.